man, you guys ready to talk about Jesus for a little while? Man, I am, I am jazzed. Um, I'm usually pretty mild-mannered, so you can tell I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited today. Um, you're like, are you always that weird? Yeah, pretty much, but uh, it's good. That's good. Hey, I want to I wanna turn back time. If I could turn back time. I want to give you... I want to give you a glimpse of me uh, a while back. Um, I grew up, and I, I've told, I've shared a little bit of this, that my great-grandpa was a preacher, and my grandpa was a preacher, so I kind of grew up in church, right? And so as I grew up in church, people ask, when did you get saved? And I'm like, I don't know, when I was like five? Like, I just, just from the time, and like, you know, like, I, I, I just, I, that was just the the world I lived, right? But, but I, want, I want to share something about my understanding of Jesus through that time. Because today, I, I really, my hope and my goal and my prayer is that, that we just step in and we learn that Jesus is not only Savior, but He's friend. And that He is closer than a brother in a time of need that you are never alone in the midst of anything because Christ is with you. But as I'm turning back time, I want you to know, I didn't have that revelation and that realization for a real long time. And you know what happened? Because I didn't have the realization and the revelation that Jesus is actually a friend to me and he's real close. Do you know how I saw Jesus and by extension God? I saw them as a far off deity. And you know what that helps to set up really well? Religion. Where my behavior could be modified in a church, but how I lived my life was different than on Sundays. And you know what that also really works really well to have? No power. So here's what happened. Is that I I was saved at like five. And I grew up in church. And so like, man, I could tell you all about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I knew the stories. I knew the expectations. But I made my own choices in the world because I didn't have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. And guys, this is where, and here's the deal, is that how many of you know that no matter where you're at in your walk, there's grace for that? And no matter where you're at, that there is a continued growth in Christ, right? So like you could have been a Christian for 75 years or 80, I hope 95, right? And the thing is, you have still room to grow in your relationship, in the fullness of Jesus. So this whole whole experience of walking with God it never gets stale. It never gets old. It is a continual process from glory to glory. Okay, so, so here I was, and, and I, didn't, I didn't have that close relationship. When I had something come up in my life, I would pray to God because that's what I was taught. But day in and day out, I would go through days and not really give Jesus much of a thought. Well, and then Sunday would come around, oh, I got to go to church. And like, like you know, oh, I'll put on my best stuff and I'll go to church and I will look the part for Jesus and then I will go. And there's nothing wrong with wearing nice stuff for Jesus, right, to honor him. But when that is a mask, where you can look the part but not ever get real with him, That's a breakdown, right? Okay. So that's what would happen. And then, you know, so, so I went through all this life. And so then, then what happened is, is that, is that my life began to look just like the world. There's no power. There was no witness. There was, there was, there, there was, there was no oomphiness to what was going on. But God, if you guys have your Bibles, let's get them out. Come on, somebody wants to read. Let's go to Matthew eleven nineteen. Woo! We're just cheering because we, we like the word of God. And we're cheering even louder because it's the gospels. And you're like, yeah, maybe it'll be words in red. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> oh, words in red, what are those? Those are just bloody words. No, they are words that, 
the Messiah Jesus threw down. So we're going to Matthew eleven nineteen, and uh, I'm going to read it with you. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I just want to stop there for just a second. I, you don't know how much the scripture has just been wrecking my heart because a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I didn't have that revelation of God 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And do you know what that did to me? That meant that when I was going and doing honoriness, I felt alienated and far away from God. And so I was on this cycle of I would go to church and I would make confessions to God, but then I would go out and do what I want. And then there was all this guilt, this condemnation, and I lived under a taskmaster God. I didn't understand the amazing goodness of a God that when I was out doing reckless things was still there with me. I didn't realize when I was in the midst of low points, he was right there with me. See, because there is nowhere, somebody say nowhere, nowhere. that you can go that the goodness of God will not be with you chasing you down. There is nowhere, your sons, your daughters, your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your dads can be that God will not come in and be in that place. Come on, somebody. And then this happened to me. I was, uh, I was about 17 years old, and me and a buddy were partying and just doing honoriness. I do not endorse that. that. That life leads to death. In my soul, in my heart, in my mind, and your body, right? But I want to show you something because this scripture came to life for me in that moment. Because here I was living riotously. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, God came upon me. We were in my house and we were partying and all of a sudden, God showed up to me in a vision. And I'm like, this isn't God, I'm tripping, man, this is not. And I was stone cold sober in that moment. Come on, somebody, I want you to see something. In my lowest point, Jesus was a friend to a sinner. He met me right where I was. And you know what he did? He began to call forth identity over me, things that I did not believe about myself because I did not see it, but God knew it because that's what he made me for. And see, I believe that there are some of you today that are, that are still believing lies that the enemy that the world has thrown down and labeled you with and Jesus is standing here saying to you those are lies that is not who you are that is not your identity I'm about to release identity to you so that you can walk into the fullness of your destiny in him because that's life and life in abundance so I'm in that moment, and Jesus begins to speak things to me. He begins to call me to preach. Oh, my goodness, I was running from that whole ideology because my grandpa, my great-grandpa, and there's this legacy thing, and that's too much, and that's too big, and I won't want it. And God begins to just speak it in love to me and begins to speak the truth of where he's leading and taking me. And see, I believe in the scripture that God is no respecter of persons. That means if he'll do it for me, if he will do it for Moses, if he will do it for Jacob, if he will do it for Daniel, if he will do it for anyone, he will do it for you as well. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And so then something happened in my heart. Something awoke in me. This love for God, this feeling of God is for me. I'm going to tell you, that was a little bit new to me. I felt like God might be for me if I was 
checking all the behavioral modified lists and everything, if I was going and I was, I was looking the good part and this and that, and all of a sudden in the midst of my sin, Jesus showed up and he revealed the truth of his heart was that he is in my corner. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not endorsing a life of sin and, and, and that sort of thing. You guys know that, right? I'm just saying that Jesus showed up in the midst of that and he was for me. Because he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's a f- friend of destitutes. He's a friend of, of ornery people. Come on, somebody. Because how do you know? Because I was ornery and he was my friend. And there's a lot of us that have been ornery and he still found us in the midst of that. And you know what can happen sometimes? All of a sudden when our life begins to change, we can begin to look down our nose at people that were living just how we were, if not for the grace of God. Guys, that is the, that is the modern day equivalent of just being religious. Let's get into something. All right. So here's the deal. Luke 2.14 says that it, when, Jesus was, when Jesus was birthed, <laughs> I don't know nothing about birthing a baby, Miss Scarlett. It's all right. We got, a, we got a cow and a moose and an inn and all that stuff. And here's Jesus coming onto this a moose. I don't know. I just threw it in there to see if you're listening. <laughs> you're like, was the inn in Alaska? Maybe. No, it wasn't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so Jesus comes on the scene and there are the angel chorus. And I love what the angel chorus releases. It says, glory to God in the highest. They're praising God. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I love this because it shows God's heart towards humanity. His heart is peace and goodwill. And he sent his son in this moment, declaring it to a world of lost humanity. And see, then Jesus begins to grow up and he begins to walk and he begins to talk and he begins to then show the Father to all of us. And that's kind of what we wanna talk about now. Because do you remember, uh, Jesus was talking to to the disciples and Philip, and this is in John 14. And uh, they're like, show us the Father. And Jesus is like, seriously? I have walked with you this whole time. Don't you realize by now, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Come on, somebody. Because Jesus only did and said what he heard the Father do and say. I believe as disciples of Jesus, when we are walking and doing life, people see the Father as we do and say what we hear the Father do and say. Some of you are already disqualifying yourself in your mind. Some of you are already saying, no, they don't see the Father when they look at me. They do see the Father when they look at you. When you are a blood-bought believer, you are reflecting who is inside of you. Come on, somebody, get a hold of that. Okay, and so let's, let's jump down. I, I wanna show God's heart um, that Jesus was representing in some scriptures and some parables because Jesus always taught in stories. Man, he was so cool about that. He was like, hey, let me tell you a story. There's a plumber and a barber and no. Um, <laughs> they walked into a, uh, just stop it right there. All right, Luke 15, let's go over there. Luke 15. I love this group of scriptures. Uh, there's, there's three stories in Luke 15. Um, there's the story of the lost sheep, the woman with the coin, and the prodigal son. Um, and they're all showing aspects of God's heart towards humanity. And so I just wanna, I wanna play with these for just a second, see what comes out. You guys heading over there? All right, if you don't have your Bible, it's on the front screen, but read your Bible, it'll bless you. Okay, Luke 15, and it starts out like this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. This one wrecks me too. Jesus was drawing the lost and the destitute toward himself. This is impactful to me because don't you often think, what are you drawing towards yourself? I I ask myself that question a lot. Um, And I started thinking, why? Why? 
did Jesus draw sinners to himself? Well, one, because there was something on him that everybody craves, right? The Holy Spirit in the kingdom of God was all over him. You got that. If you are a believer, that's you. You have that draw on you because you have the source of life in you. That's what you have. So often you forget about that during the day of, of where you're going. Your day gets busy and you're like, I'm doing this and I'm juggling plates and I got to do this and I got to do that and I got a list and I'm checking it off and all of a sudden there's someone in need and I'm like, well, I'm busy and I'll come back and I'll just see us on Sunday. But the fact of the matter is, is that you are ready in season and out of season. In the midst of all this, you're juggling. You're like, what is that? Is that theatrical mime? What is he doing? No, that's, yeah, it is, I guess. You're juggling, right? Well, those are plates spinning, I think. Here's juggling. All right. (laughs) Plates spinning, juggling. Well, I won't ask you to try it. Okay. Um, In the midst of all that, you still have the source of life in you. Let's get in this. Okay, so he's drawing the tax collectors and the sinners to him. They're coming because he has, he has the words that will lead to life. And he's doing it in a way that's not religiously oppressive and condescending to them. You know, you can put off an attitude, right? You can put off judgment. Come on, somebody. I'm claiming that to tax collectors and sinners, Jesus wasn't putting off. He had a problem with other people, but tax collectors and sinners, he was okay with. And the Pharisees and the scribes, Q verse 2, right? And the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Oh. Yeah, exactly. He receives sinners and he eats with them. And Jesus was okay with that. You know, sometimes you ever feel like you don't want to be seen with someone? Now, they might not even know that's going on in your brain. They might not know what's going on between your ears. But I just want to encourage you. Jesus hung with everyone. And he had compassion. We're going to get there, but not yet. All right, so jumping in. Okay, Luke. Okay, so he told him this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lay... How many of you guys have been that sheep? Come on, somebody. I was telling you in this story, at 17 years old, I was that sheep. I was that sheep that was lost. And Jesus broke into my situation to find me. And it goes on, and it says, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends. Oh, I lost verse five. Hold on, this is important. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. See, this, is, this was a disconnect from my religious mindset beforehand. This was a disconnect because do you see this imagery that Jesus comes down and he takes the sheep to his bosom. He pulls the individual close to himself. Why? Because God is for you and he loves you. He seeks you out in the very places that you're like, God would never be here. I'm going to let it drop. Okay. My wife does this ministry. It's a beautiful ministry for what she does. She, um, she goes on and she serves women. And she leads teams that, that serve women that, uh, that, are, that are caught up in, in, in different t- aspects of, of, of the sex industry. She goes in and they just, they just talk to them. They bring them gifts. They love on them. They pray for them. They form friendships. Can I be real with you? When prom first brought that to me, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, and she was like, I, I, 
my religious went up. I was like, what? Why? No, Jesus wouldn't go there, right? Come on, I'm just being real with you. But then all of a sudden I begin to see the love of God for people everywhere. And if we have this ideology of I'm too good for this or I'm too holy for that, and I'm not talking about dabbling in sin. I hope you're tracking with me on that. But I'm saying I'm not too holy to take the kingdom anywhere because how do they hear and how do they feel and how do they meet Jesus if we won't go? So God comes and he takes, he takes the sheep and he puts them on his shoulder and he begins to rejoice and he comes back to his neighbors and he says, rejoice with me for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous person who need no repentance. Do you see heaven's heart? Heaven's heart is for you and me and every single person to know God. And not just to know him as deity, but to begin to know him through Jesus as friend in a relational way that we're walking it and we're talking it and we're living it with him. Come on, there's another good one. I love this parable of the woman with the lost coin. I love it for so many reasons. One, I, testing. I love it because, because Jesus is talking to these religious people and he says this woman has lost a coin. Now remember, in Israel at this time, women were... <laughs> they were like low man on the totem pole. They didn't have rights. They didn't have, they didn't have a place in society. And here Jesus is in the midst of these religious minded people beginning to compare God to a woman. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. How many years has, has religion and still does try to relegate women to a lower place than a man? Now that is a lie straight from hell. Come on, somebody. Come on, get a hold of the fact that God made man and woman in his image. And so there is definitely a feminine image of God as well as a male. And see, I'm sorry, I got to go here. Too long, cowardly men. Yeah, I was this, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm still not going to stop talking. <laughs> How long have cowardly men in places of power kept women relegated to a lower level to make themselves seem bigger? No, 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 that is not how the Messiah rolled. In fact, of the matter, he began to throw down seven different kinds of smoke, and he begins to talk to these sinners and these Pharisees about the fact that God has this, this feminine side. And he says, or what woman? Having ten silver coins, if she loses, come on, one single coin. I love this, because it, it tells me one you're counted by God. You mean something. He knows you. And just simply one coin falls down. He's after it. And I, and I think sometimes, because, because you have value, I think sometimes in my own life, if I drop a quarter, who cares? Forget about it. Seriously, right? You know, are you like, you even like are walking and it's raining and there's a penny on the ground. I'm not going to stop and pick the penny up. I'm going to keep walking. You're like, obviously, you're so sweet, you'd melt. Get out of the rain, kid. <laughs> it's a joke, right? But God says, actually, every single one of you has value. To the point, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, and I'm going to look for you because you matter. Will you tell your neighbor something? Will you tell them you matter? Oh, man. 
You guys are sweet. That's so kind of you to say. Thank you. All right, then we're going to read on. Verse 9. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Do you see the excitement and the joy of God in finding you? God is excited and happy to know you. I have a little, I have a little girl. She's, she's two and a half, a little more. And uh, the best thing in the world, I mean like heaven in a microcosm of a nutshell, is when I come home from work. Come on, somebody. Because this little girl might be playing toys, hanging with Peppa Pig, and she just, Play-Doh, and she just drops it. And she runs to welcome me. Daddy's home. Okay, I don't, I'm just going to tell you, I don't care how bad my day has been. In an instant, it's better. That's the kind of excitement that Daddy God has when one sinner comes back to him. That's the excitement that Jesus has when you decide to turn in more to his face. To spend time with him in his presence. God gets happy because of you. I'm not saying God's in a bad mood otherwise, but you make him happy. That's kind of a cool thought. You know what I'm saying? Because you think like infinitesimally small I am in comparison to the infinite amount of stars in the sky, and yet Jesus chose us, and we bring joy to Daddy when we come home. Come on, somebody. All right, there's another parable in here. Let's just, let's just taste and see just a little bit, all right? All right, just, we'll just dip a toe, all right? In fact, I had a word, and I'm going to share this right now because um, in worship today, I felt that there was someone or some ones that were like standing at the edge of a river or a lake and just starting to like reach a toe out into the water. I heard that there are some individuals here that are getting more curious about Holy Spirit, about worship, about stepping into more of that. And that there's this, there's this line of like uncertainty and fear in your heart. And I, I'm telling you that, that, that God is releasing to you right now that he only gives you good gifts. There's this story of David when he's bringing the Ark of a Covenant back to the city of Jerusalem and he's dancing and he like takes off his clothes and he's got his tunic and he's like twirling around and he's dancing. Music was right on key for my twirl. Thank you, God. No. There's like an eight-year-old girl that's like, that's a pirouette. totally playing. I, I could be totally wrong in a pirouette if I'm in it. But anyhow, D- David is like, he's like da- dancing before the king and he has this, this great thought of, I will become even more undignified. I just want to encourage you. Just dip that toe even farther in. Put that foot in. Just taste and see how good God is. Come on, somebody. That's for you. Don't throw it away. Don't be like, mm, well, I might have thought that, but I wasn't thinking it right that second. It, well, you were, and God told me about it, so there it is. Let's wrap up with a prodigal son. You guys with me? Luke 15, 11. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of this property now. And the story goes on. The son demands his inheritance, and then he runs off with it. And he lives pretty reckless. And he spends it all. And there's lots of aspects of this, but what I want to focus on is the heart of the father. The son saying that was a great offense to dad. But what I love, as you read on down through there, the father did not live in offense. Kiddos, I'm just going to tell you, parents can feel rejected too right? And when you have a root of rejection, there's, there's, this, 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 there's this offense that grows, right? It would have been easy for that father to be so hurt because of his son's rejection that he stayed offended. Because we do this, don't we? 
Someone hurts us and we feel that rejection. We feel that pushing away. And so then we're just like, well, if they're going to reject me, I'm going to reject them. And so then the rejection comes up and then we're stuck in that cycle of offense. And, and it just gets worse, right? It doesn't get better until someone decides to forgive. I believe there are people right now that are living in rejection and offense. And the thought of forgiving makes you mad. Like, how do you know? Because I've been there. You know, like this week, right? No, yes, really. Okay. But watch this. Just jump on down. Verse 17, this, this dude that has, has, has like a, ran off from daddy, he, he comes to himself. He's, he's feeding these pigs, and he's like, oh, that half-eaten apple looks really good. That's pretty hungry, right? I feed my chickens, and I'm going to assure you that the cut-up onion that I'm giving them or whatever, the corn husk, does not look appetizing to me. But that's where he was at. And he realizes, I could just go back home. I could just go back home and say, take me on as a servant, dude. I'll work for you. I, 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 will, I will feed your sheep because your sheep. Your sheep, I'll just feed your pigs, feed your cattle. I'll do that job. You know what I love about Daddy God is that he doesn't call us servant slaves anymore, but he calls us sons and daughters. And so that prodigal son starts heading back home. Now, it was such a great offense what he did to his dad that if he came back in that town, he was going to be stoned for the offense and the shame he had brought upon his family. And so you have this imagery of a father pacing the floor. Don't you wonder how many times in the hours of the night that dad would have gotten up and just looked out and just hoped, just hoped to see that son or that daughter coming back to him how many praying moms and grandmas and dads are doing that very same thing and I just want to tell you that there is hope in that prayer if you have made that petition to God for 5 years for 10 years for 15 years for 20 years don't lose hope because they're going to have that moment that come, that, that I came to myself moment where they're going to come home. And see, the father sees him. And, and the father, the father doesn't even wait on the son to come back to the house. I love that because that's the heart of God. The heart of God, as soon as you make that turn, he is running to you. And he does. And he embraces his son. He puts a robe around him. He puts a ring on his finger. He's celebrating that this son that stepped out came back. Guys, that's, that's God. That's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I always, I, I was blessed that, that I had a real good grandma and grandpa growing up. And, and I also, um, and that was good because there was a time and season when, when my mom and dad were doing some reckless stuff, Right? God's really good. He puts people around you that can help you in those times in addition. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is always there, but sometimes flesh and blood helps. I want somebody to hear this. There is a generation of orphans that God cares about. And there's a scripture that says he sets the fatherless in families I want you to be aware of the people that God is positioning around you because there are some moms and dads in here that don't even realize that you are positioned in a place to pour life into some people. Maybe you do and you're like, I feel like I'm just heating my head against the wall. Hope right now. Hope to you. So Jesus... 
he takes this, he takes this kid home and he celebrates and they have a party. They, they, they slaughter this fatted calf. And then the older brother, the older brother comes in. You know what I love about God? Is we always, we always knock the older brother. And for reason, right, right? But Papa God doesn't shut his love, love off to him either. The older brother comes in and he's like, what's going on? Why is there this party and this music? This, this brother of mine, he's came back after he squandered all of this money and you're celebrating him? He doesn't understand. He thinks that this is an injustice. And you know how we get when we feel like there's an injustice happening, right? We feel like someone is getting something that we're entitled to. That's where the older brother was. And the father, the father says, oh, my beloved child, don't you realize that everything I have is yours? Everything that God has is yours. It's really a cool thought. It's a thought that means when someone is getting blessed, when someone is getting, was getting stuff poured onto their life, I don't have to be jealous of them. I can actually celebrate them. When somebody at work gets a promotion that I think is mine, I can celebrate them. When someone has good fortune in their life and I'm like, oh, I want that, I can celebrate them. Because other people being blessed by daddy does not decrease my ability to be blessed by daddy. Someone else doing more and getting more just means celebration for daddy. Because the bank account of heaven does not go down because someone gets higher.